We're talking today with Texas Land Commissioner Jerry Patterson, and uh, we're getting right. ready to come into the Texas legislative session. Not quite as strong a Republican majority in the House as we had before, but the Senate's kind of up in the air a little bit with uh, the passing of Senator Gallegos. Um, what issues are you looking at in terms of your position as land commissioner that need to come before the, the legislature and that they're going to be looking at? Well, there's a lot of things that we have a great interest in, and I'm not sure that most of the folks that will be watching uh, our, our video here today have the same interest, but I'm interested in issues that have to do with uh, eminent domain, pipeline right away. We have a controversy underway now in East Texas on the a portion of the Keystone XL pipeline that goes from Cushing, Oklahoma to Port Arthur. Um, you know, it's an interesting dynamic up there now. We have the radical environmental left, uh, the Socialist Workers Party, uh, the folks who hate all oil and gas or any carbon-based energy, mm -hmm. who are tree-sitting and tying themselves to uh, heavy equipment. We have those groups allied with some of our conservative pro-property right Tea Party people mm -hmm. in opposition to the eminent domain process of this pipeline. Uh, so it's pretty interesting dynamic in politics there to watch that. But, you know, in Texas, uh, up until the recent Supreme Court decision that's commonly known as the Denbury, D-E-N-B-U-R-Y, uh, a pipeline company could merely go to the Railroad Commission, fill out a form, and they had the power of eminent domain to build a pipeline because they said on that form that, yes, we are a common carrier. Mm -hmm. There was no verification. Uh, but the Supreme Court, you know, I've had some issues with our Texas Supreme Court on a couple of decisions, but on this one the Supreme Court got it right. They said that if the pipeline is to be a common carrier, it can't just carry its own product. It's essentially got to carry product or commodity or oil or gas or whatever from multiple uh, sources, multiple companies in order to be that. And just filling out a form does not make that company a common uh, carrier and therefore have the ability to eminent domain. So we're going to watch very carefully any legislation on that. Uh, we're also very interested in a proposal to help uh, defend the Texas Open Beaches Act. Mm -hmm. You know, I was sued by a lady in California who, who came out like a bandit. You know, she bought property on the Gulf Coast. She had a, she, we paid her to move the property. We were offered her a buyout. Her insurance paid her for the homes destroyed in the hurricane. And uh, FEMA also bought, she came out and then she sued me personally in the Texas General Land Office because uh, we told her that when the beach erodes, she loses property. Right. And uh, the public easement and the public access could in, 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 you know, infringe on her property there. Well, she sued me and she won. Our Texas Supreme Court made the wrong decision. I praised them and I not always praise them on that case, but we're going to look at some legislative changes to help defend open beaches in Texas. It's been Texas since 1836 that you have a right to be on the beach. As we're looking at that. That's a land issue. And of course, we're interested in oil and gas issues. We want to continue the strong uh, hydrocarbon uh, natural gas industry in Texas. Uh, we're blessed with resources. We need to be able to access them. And the Eagle Ford Shale is a, a great example right. of what's going on with yeah. that. Eagle Ford uh, play, the Permian Basin uh, is doing well out there as well. And new technology, uh, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, maybe four years ago, the idea that we could say the United States was going to be energy independent was laughable. Mm -hmm. You know, the peak oil crowd had carried the day, and, and it really is. I mean, within a decade, we could be, particularly if we switch to natural gas as a transportation fuel, we can be energy independent. And I know Texas has issued some grants now to some companies to start building natural gas refueling stations and vehicle conversions and things like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, that just if, if we were to ab able to use them in fleet applications, that would have a big impact. You know, the uh, private vehicle application, that's probably a little, you know, that's a good idea. It may be behind it, but any fleet that operates in an urban area that goes back to the same location, like postal or like delivery or like repair, uh, our airport application for buses, uh, that should be running on, on natural gas. City vehicles. City vehicles. If they go back to the same place and you can refuel them there, they ought to be running on natural gas. Now, I hope everyone knows that you were the author of the uh, Texas Concealed Carry Permit. And uh, last session, there was quite a movement to bring forward open carry right. to the state of Texas. And um, we're 
Where do you sit on that that issue now? It's come, going to come back before the legislature again this session. Well, I was the author of the concealed handgun law. I had to defend that. I had to defend that against every editorial board in the state of Texas that said if we passed the concealed handgun law, it would be blood in the streets, wild wild west, and shootouts at every four way stop. None of that happened. Similarly. I'm a proponent of open carry. If you have a license to carry, that's what we're talking about. In Texas, if you got a license, you can carry openly. The same people that said blood in the streets 15 years ago are saying it'd be blood in the streets with open carry. They have the same lack of credibility today as they had then. And literally, statistics show that the states that have concealed carry laws, actually crime goes down in those states, especially violent crime. Well, it, crime has had an overall violent crime, uh, firearm crime has had an overall uh, continued decrease. Uh, the numbers are pretty dramatic. I think uh, when I passed the concealed handgun law, the deaths per 100,000 population in the, U in the United States was seven per 100,000 by firearms, firearms deaths. Today, the last year for data is 2009, the firearms deaths are 2.98. It's gone down 55%. And what's happened in that period of time? More concealed handgun licenses in states across the nation, uh, larger per capita ownership of firearms. Can you make that a cause and effect? I don't think you can. But what you can certainly say is those who predicted doom and gloom were wrong then, and they're wrong now. You know, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago, Chicago's got the strongest handgun. <laughs> strongest anti-gun legislation exactly. in, in the country yeah, exactly. and they lead the nation in handgun murders but yeah. they've, they've come up with a solution for it they're going to put a nickel tax on every bullet sold yeah in that's the city right of Chicago. so you know that, that'll that would be a deterrent because that guy who's about to shoot somebody a gangbanger is going to go you know i don't want to do that it's going to cost me an extra nickel yeah can't do that you know. maybe they'll be get to be better shots and you won't have somebody else yeah like, exactly save ammo but uh well, Jerry, thank you very much for the work that well, you've been doing for us at, in Texas, both as in the, uh, the legislature and as the land commissioner. And I, I think that uh, we look forward to many great things coming out of this upcoming session. I do, too. Let's hope it happens. All right. Thanks.